This MSI MPG Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi motherboard supports an Intel Core i9-13900K processor with a mighty 19 phases of VRMs for the V-Core at 105 amps apiece. That's a lot of power. It also has heaps of support for M.2 SSDs. We've got onboard 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, Wi-Fi 6E. On the face of it, it's got a lot going for it. However, the BIOS needs some work. When you really hammer the CPU, it does this. And that is both slightly disturbing and rather disappointing. So let's dig in and see what on earth is going on with this 500 pound motherboard. Iron Wolf Pro, tough, ready, scalable. We'll take a tour of the MPG Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi and then dive into the specifics. So it's an ATX form factor rather than E80X, which makes it much more convenient to install in most cases. It supports LGA 1700, so 12th and 13th gen, DDR5 memory up to 7600 if you're overclocking. We have two EPS connectors behind the fixed IO shield and this cosmetic plate, which is in turn on top of the VRM heat sinks. The heat sinks are profiled to be the best way of describing them rather than finned. So they have quite a lot of bulk and a reasonable amount of surface area. We have some fan headers at the top of the board, fan headers at the side, so basically four in this corner, and fan headers at the foot of the board, main power connector at the side, next to a type C connector, a laid down old school USB type A connector, and laid down SATA. M.2 installation, so the primary slot, which is above the graphics slot, that catch there releases. Well, it's come away in one go, that's interesting. Let's just put that back and try that again, see what happens second time. Release that catch and lift it off. And this time the SSD remains in place. Release that plastic catch and the SSD comes out. So installation and removal is tool free. Uh, it would seem actually that uh, removal of the SSD is uh, almost hands free. But uh, I like that. It means you haven't got to fiddle around with a very small screw while the board's upright and in your PC. Then we have the other M.2s. I think we can agree the top two M.2s are available regardless of your graphics card and how you have it installed. However, the bottom three of graphics card is likely to overhang that cover. So it is debatable whether it'd be better if the cover was separate uh, rather than being one great big unit. It is interesting to note that we have your main graphics slot up here. Then we have what is essentially the secondary times 16 slot down there. And then we have a times one in the middle. How many PCI Express slots do you use these days? Personally, I use a graphics card. You might want to add in a sound card perhaps. Uh, but if you have a card to add in, it's likely to go down the bottom. You have to ask yourself, is it then going to hang down over the uh, headers and connectors at the foot of the board? While we have a debug display at the top of the board, we don't have any micro buttons on the board itself. What we do have is something interesting going on on the rear I.O. panel. We have two USB 3.2 Gen 1s, those are 5 gigabits per second, and we have six USB 3.2 Gen 2, 10 gigabit per second. The two Type C's are different to each other. One is USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2, that's 20 gigabits per second. The other is USB 3.2 Gen 2, 10 gigabits per second. The single ethernet is 2.5 gigabit and we have Wi-Fi 6E plus audio connectors. The three buttons are of interest. One is for clear CMOS and the other is for flashing your BIOS without building a PC first. The third button is a smart button and its function can be set in the BIOS. The one thing it can't do is to act as a power button. I have to ask the question, if you're reaching around the back of your PC blindly and stabbing for one of these buttons, I don't think you'd have a clue which you were hitting. This is useful if the motherboard is on a test bench. I think once it's built into the PC, its function is frankly marginal. I also like to have a power button on board if I have the option, and up in this corner near this debug display is good. 
So when your PC is built, if you have some sort of issue, you can reach inside and press the button just to check you haven't got something bizarre going on with your case. I find the configuration of those micro buttons slightly odd, but broadly speaking, it's a perfectly decent layout. When it comes to the VRMs, we have a Rene Sass RAA229131, 20 phase controller, and then we have the VRMs arranged in a 19 plus one plus one configuration. They're all 105 amps, and obviously 19 for the V core. One of those VRMs is powering the integrated graphics, and you will note we have an onboard HDMI uh, if you're using integrated graphics from your motherboard in some way, shape, or form. That's useful again for bug fixing and such like. Switching from your graphics card to the IGP can highlight where your problem lies, but it's not the sort of thing you'll be doing all that often. It's more like a get out of jail card. Our test setup for this review consists of the MSI motherboard, obviously, Core i9-13900K CPU, and a Sabrent Rocket Gen 4 SSD. Let's just snap the heatsink over the SSD. We have some G-Skill Trident Z6000 rated memory. Power supplies is Seasonic Vertex GX1200, so 1200 watts, gold rated ATX 3.0. We're using Arctic MX6 thermal compound. The CPU cooler is this Corsair H150i Elite LCD, so it's a 360mm AIO. On with the cover, which also has the LCD display and hook up the three fans for the cooler which go directly to the motherboard so they're controlled by the BIOS they're not going through the Corsair hub and therefore IQ has nothing to do with fan speed the final piece of hardware is this Gigabyte RTX 4080 gaming OC graphics card and the 12 volt high power connector which comes with the Seasonic Vertex connects like thus here we are in the BIOS and we have everything set to auto. The only change from default is that XMP has been enabled, so our G-Skill is going to run at a full 6,000 mega transfers. And we can see the three power profiles based on the type of cooler you're using. The box cooler essentially runs the CPU at stock. The air tower gives it a bit more juice and liquid cooling means the power is unlimited. A quick run in Blender shows that we're pulling 1.38 or 1.39 volts at the CPU and this leads to a package power of 300 watts. This is on the excessive side of things but that voltage is very high. The consequence is the processor is bouncing off 100 Celsius and as a result the performance is not as good as the clock speeds might suggest. So let's make a few changes in the BIOS. Our CPU is a decent CPU, but we reviewers expect to get the better CPU sent to us as part of the silicon lottery. We know it can run on 1.25 volts with LLC set at 3. However, I'm going to set the voltage to 1.3 volts, which is more juice than it requires and closer to the default. I'm also going to let the LLC droop to level 5 and I'm going to set the base clock to a solid 100 without any dynamic behavior. And let's see how that works. Running the CPU test again, we can see the CPU is now far happier. It's running cooler, drawing less power, and running on significantly less core voltage. In essence, we've undervolted the CPU, and it's running faster because it's able to sit at a steady 5.5 gigahertz on the P cores. This is great news and it helps performance. Of course, it's possible that this bizarre bias behavior only afflicts the Core i9-13900K. So let's take a look at the Core i7-13700K and see what's going on there. First on auto settings and then with exactly the same manual settings as we used on the Core i9. And we can see once again the Core i7 suffering on auto and benefits from those manual voltage settings. But what about the Core i5-13600K? Surely they can't be feeding too much voltage and power to that process. Oh, yes they are. 
And what happens when we change over to manual settings on the Core i5? Once again, we see this CPU also benefits. So the three K-SKU CPUs are all being overpowered by the liquid cooling profile in the BIOS. So let's turn to the performance charts and see how that all works out. In Cinebench R23 multi-core, with the Core i9 running on those manual settings you've just seen, the MSI is at the top of our chart. Look a couple of places down and you'll see the ASUS ROG Maximus Z790 Hero, the motherboard I used when I did the launch review of this processor, and you'll see that the same processor on a different motherboard with different power settings scored significantly fewer points. Power consumption, this is the CPU power consumption rather than the system, and those same figures are reversed. So the Core i9 on the MSI with manual settings, 260 watts. However, if we'd stuck to auto, we'd be pulling 300 watts, as you saw, which would have made it look even worse. CPU temperature in Cinebench R23. With the manual settings, the Core i9 on the Carbon Wi-Fi runs at 87 Celsius. Again, on auto, as you saw, 100 or even 101 degrees, i.e. throttling. So the settings are absolutely critical. Cinebench R23 single core. In essence, we have the ASUS ROG Maximus and the MSI MPG Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi in a dead heat. Both processors running at 5.8 GHz on a single core, and both therefore topping the charts. But in fairness to ASUS, they sneak the win by a tiny handful of points. Blender Classroom. The mighty 16-core AMD Zen 4 processors top the charts, followed by the Core i9-13900K, Azus sneaking the win over MSI by a few seconds. 7-zip version 21 benchmark. As with the previous test, we have the 16 core Ryzen's at the top of the chart and the Core i9 in the middle of the chart. It's close, but Azus just sneaks the win over MSI on those manual settings. In 3D Mark CPU profile, the Core i9 does well. However, Azus has the beating of MSI by a handful of points. And then we move on to gaming. Borderlands 3 at 1440p. This is interesting because the Core i9, Core i7, Core i5 all have the same average frame rates. But when you look at the 1% lows, you can see a significant difference. It's also worth noting the MSI on manual settings does slightly better in 1% lows than the MSI on auto settings. Borderlands 3 at 1080p. Here we get a bit of a spread of figures. So the Core i5's at the bottom, Core i7 is above, and Core i9 above that. However, this time the auto figures just by one frame beat the manual settings. In essence, this is a tie. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy at 1440p. 7950X 3D at the top, followed by the MSI with the Core i9. Manual settings again beating auto settings, this time 2 FPS differential. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy at 1080p. This is starting to look like a familiar tale. At the top of the chart, Ryzen 9 7950X 3D, followed by the Core i9 on the MSI. Manual settings and auto, in essence, a tie. The 1 has a slightly higher average by a single FPS, and then it has a slightly lower 1% low by 1 FPS. Far Cry 6 at 1440. Hallelujah! At the top of the chart, by a tiny margin, it's the MSI on manual settings with the Core i9. And then 3 FPS on average lower, we have the MSI on auto. However, you'll note the MSI on auto scores slightly higher on 1% low. In other words, those auto settings on the MSI are not completely bonkers. Far Cry 6 at 1080p. Top of the chart, Ryzen 9 7950X 3D, followed by the Core i9 on manual settings on the MSI, followed by the Core i9 on auto settings. And there is a reasonable spread in those two figures on the MSI. Hitman 3 at 1440, top of the chart, Ryzen 9 7950X 3D, followed by the Core i9 on the MSI on manual settings, and then a few FPS behind the Core i9 on the MSI on auto settings. Probably worth checking out the differential in 1% lows rather than the average, 106 versus 100. Having said that, the Core i7 is only a tiny step behind the Core i9. Hitman 3 at 1080p, top of the chart, the MSI running on auto with the Core i9. 
you have to go back quite a few FPS to find the MSI on manual settings. So those auto settings in Hitman 3 at 1080 are clearly working. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440p. Blimey, there are some huge frame rates going on here. Top of the chart, topping 300 on average, Ryzen 9 7950X 3D. Then Core i9s in the 250 FPS or so. Realistically, the auto and manual settings, it's a tie. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p. Topping the chart, passing 300 FPS, Ryzen 9 7950X 3D. And then we have the Core i9 on the MSI Carbon Wi-Fi with the auto settings beating out the manual settings by 3 FPS. Watch Dogs Legion at 1440p. We've got the Ryzen 9 7950X 3D with a clear lead. And then we have a bunch of processors effectively tying. So the Core i9 on the MSI, on auto and on manual, there's nothing to choose between them. Watch Dogs Legion at 1080p. Top of the chart, Ryzen 9 7950X 3D. Then we have the Core i9 on MSI on manual. And then we have a tie between the Core i7 on manual settings and the Core i9 on auto settings. And so you may wonder, what do I think about the MSI MPG Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi motherboard? And even though I suspect you know where I'm going to go with this conclusion, I'm still going to go there. Pros, the good points. High-end hardware with rock-solid VRMs. I have not mentioned VRM temperatures in this review because they're utterly trivial. On the Core i5, Core i7, VRM temps uh, in repeated runs of Blender, 48 Celsius and the Core i9, 54 Celsius. Nothing, absolutely negligible. And you'll note the test bench has the fans somewhere approximately close to the VRM heat sinks, but you haven't got a fan right here. So I suspect you'll see even lower temperatures with your motherboard mounted in a case with a rear case fan installed in the usual manner. And I suspect those rock solid VRMs are also conversely a problem. They're so huge, so solid with such great cooling that MSI knows they can throw all the power in the world at them and they're gonna laugh in the face of adversity. And that means the power gets fed through to the CPU with the consequences that you saw. Continuing the pros, we have tool-free primary SSD installation. I've praised this feature a number of times. Now I've used it many times. I actually think it needs a little bit of refinement. The plastic clip on the SSD itself sometimes has a habit of coming undone, but the principle is very good. I like this idea. I want to see more of it. Wi-Fi 6E is included. I know you probably stick an ethernet cable in the back of your PC, but if you're gonna have Wi-Fi, it should be good Wi-Fi. And this is. And there are seven fan headers at the top and bottom of the board. Not only do you get lots of fan headers, the locations are really convenient. Cons, the negative points. The BIOS needs work as it delivers excess power to your CPU. Specifically, it's the V core that's excessive, which suggests that the ampage is actually slightly low. Uh, but the uh, volts times amps comes out to 300 plus watts when the CPU is under load. MSI. Come along now, we've had conversations with you and even though there's been an update to the BIOS, you have not addressed this issue. The micro buttons do not include a button for power and the smart button settings also do not include one for power. You can play around with the fans and the lighting, but not the power. I think that's bizarre. And finally, the price tag is fairly high. In the intro, I said 500 pounds is actually 470 here in the UK, but that's a lot of money. Overall, I'm on the fence with this one. If they fix the bias, it's an eight out of 10 and worth buying. If the bias remains unfixed, I'm gonna say seven and a half and worth considering.